start recording. And then let me uh, temporarily stop uh, my share here. Okay, so, um, so yes, so now that I'm recording, uh, again, just kind of to reiterate, um, um, homework six is uh, completely optional. Um, you can do it, uh, you don't have to do it. Um, the final exam, uh, I will allow students to delay taking the final exam by, uh, you know, basically up to three months um, at, as needed. I, um, so, uh, and, and you, all you have to do is just email me and let me know uh, when a better time to, uh, to take the exam would be. Uh, the exam is uh, on, going to be on HackerRank. Um, I'm planning um, the exam as it's currently scheduled is scheduled for Tuesday of finals week. Um, so Tuesday of finals week is um, June 9th. Okay, so that's the, uh, the current schedule. Uh, I'll probably leave, uh, um, allow it to be, the exam to be accessed on HackerRank from uh, um, current plan is say 10 a.m. to uh, 10 p.m. or maybe I'll do 10 a.m. to midnight. Um, and the exam will be, um, you'll get three hours to, uh, to complete it, but um, um, probably uh, I, what I will do is I will pick from HackerRank, I'll select a kind of a selection of problems so that kind of the, the median time to finish will be like an hour and 15, according to HackerRank, where they kind of collected stats on uh, kind of their question pool. Uh, and I'm sorry, uh, I told you I would ha I would have the uh, the question pool ready, and I would I would tell you exactly what what would uh, kind of what kind of questions you can expect. Um, but I haven't I haven't finished um, selecting the problems yet, so um, it will be uh, it will be open browser like the uh, practice final. Again, the uh, you know don't you're not allowed to plagiarize code, but if you need to look up documentation, um, look up. Uh, how a certain function is used, uh, that, that's fine with me, okay? Uh, but you're not allowed to just kind of um, copy and paste code from Stack Exchange directly or something. That, that's gonna get flagged by the um, hacker rank uh, plagiarism detector. Um, and, uh, and so, um, so you know, that, that would cause a problem. But, but if you need documentation, if you need to reference the documentation, that's fine. Okay, you're allowed to uh, reference documentation, but um, and so it's, it'll be open browser in that in that regard, open notes, uh, open book, whatever whatever you need. But um, but you're not allowed to just type in the uh, problem statement and then copy and paste uh, someone else's solution there. Okay, uh, I, th I think that's a reasonable um, uh, expectation. So uh, so it'll be taken on HackerRank um, and. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any questions um, regarding the, uh, the thing. Okay, how far is it in difficulty of the practice exam? Okay, so for the practice exam, I selected all problems that were rated uh, easy. Um, and so for the final exam, I'll probably select mostly easy and then maybe like a medium difficulty. Um, you can go on HackerRank and look at kind of um, exercises in Python as a, to get a sense of kind of like what kind of questions um, exist on HackerRank and things like that. Um, so you can, uh, you can kind of just practice problems yourself on HackerRank uh, to do. So would it be good practice to do uh, other exercises from the textbook? Um, yes, uh, I would say the best practice would be to go on HackerRank um, and there's kind of just a, a series of problems and things that, uh, that you can um, uh, you can kind of go through and, and practice uh, as well. So, so I would say HackerRank is going to be a good, good source of practice there. Um, and, and in general, I would say it's a, it's a pretty decent place to practice um, coding skills if you are, if you are planning on, um, you know, applying for an internship or something of that nature. Um, you know, uh, a, not all companies, but but a lot of companies do employ. Uh, hacker rank as kind of a kind of a first pass filter for the uh, technical interview because um, it, it's uh, very convenient right they just email you a link you take it you give it some time uh, and then they come back um, 
they they come back and uh, you know gives you a score and whatnot. Uh, and probably the as far as the interviews for companies go, uh, the problems will range from easy to hard and things like that. So just to kind of distinguish um, one from each other. But, um, uh, any, any other questions uh, there um, regarding exam stuff or uh, accommodations or anything like that? And, and again, if if um, if right now is not a good time for you to take the exam, uh, feel free to just email me and say, "Hey, I want I want to take um, uh, the exam at another time." Um, so uh, I. Uh, I was originally planning on it to practice via Zoom, but uh, I think I'm going to, um, uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll use, uh, we'll use HackerRank um, and we won't, um, um, it won't be formally uh, proctored. Um, so, um, uh, you know, as, uh, I guess I'll rely on HackerRank's plagiarism detector to uh, discourage collaboration and plagiarism in that in that regard. Uh, so if you copy each other or something, that that will get flagged by uh, HackerRank's plagiarism detector. Um, so that will be uh, kind of the the method to discourage uh, dishonesty there. Um, and again, uh, I do not curve any of my classes. Uh, I do not believe that. A student's grade should be based on their uh, performance compared to other students. So, um, so you'll be graded strictly on the um, the uh, the performance uh, and results of your own code, not whether um, you performed better or worse than someone else. Okay. So, um, so for Hacker Rank, yeah, the the way they grade is based on the hidden test cases. Um, so, so, uh, they were, there will be, um, you know, a problem statement. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure what it looks like for you when you take the exam, but, um, but there's a problem statement and, uh, and they have a whole bunch of test cases, some that are visible to you and some that are, uh, invisible, uh, to the student. Um, and, uh, and, and your final grade on the assignment is uh, is based on the uh, the performance of the code across uh, all of the test cases. Um, so, um, so when you did the practice, you were able to see the ten test cases. Okay, and and basically, if you, um, okay, so I I'm not sure if you're if you're able to see all the cases or not. Um, are you able to see the inputs and the outputs for every single case? I think. In my experience, HackerRank lets you see the inputs and outputs for some of the cases, but then when you run it, what, what it does is like certain cases are hidden and they'll just kind of give you a, a, a pass or fail on the, on the thing. And so, so, so you know, um, yeah, so after, after you take the exam, I think HackerRank gives you the, the feedback immediately, right? Is that, is that the case or no? It's going to be very similar to the practice exam, except just a different selection of problems and a little bit longer. Okay, because because uh, it's uh, when I set out the practice exam, it um, I, I set it up basically as a so these are in Hacker Rank they are being set up as like mock interviews. They're they're being set up as interviews, right? And um, um, so so that's the case. So if all the test cases run and work, is that 100% on the question? Um, I'm gonna say yes. There, there is like a thing, if you, um, and you see so you're not graded on efficiency, but there are exceptions in that if your code is very inefficient, uh, HackerRank will time out your code. So if, you're, if your solution takes like too long to, um, to run, then uh, HackerRank will automatically time out and your code will fail. Um, a particular test case. So usually there's like a few simple test cases and then one of the test cases will be like really long. I say, I think for example, um, there was like one where you had to like write a script that got, got rid of the vowels or something like that. And, um, and so if you had um, like 
uh, very inefficient code or something like you wrote like um, I don't know some something that wasn't good then um, your code will probably pass the easy cases and fail the long case okay um, and um, uh, can you see the score of our practice exam since you did not see that okay um I am not sure. I am not sure if I am able to let you see your own scores. Um, I don't, let me, let me look at the, okay. Uh, all right, so I am not able to, uh, there's no setting on hacker rank to let you see your own scores. Um, um, let me, I'll, I'll see what I can do, okay? Uh, I'm not sure if there's a way for me to, uh, I, there's no, uh, I just kind of went through their website. So there's not a, there's not a way for you to see your own scores. I, I apologize for that. Um, although, okay, so again, if you're, if you're wondering how to practice, um, go to HackerRank, um, log in, and, um, Let me see. Um, okay, so let me share my screen. All right, so when you when you log into to Hacker Rank, okay, um, there's kind of you can go to practice, um, and there's like skills available for practice. All right, um, so I mean you can click any of these things, but uh, you can just start off with kind of like Python, okay? And then, uh, you know, look at the, I would say, uh, easy, easy and medium things, right? And, um, you know, try, uh, you know, click one of these things. And, uh, and I don't want to do this live because I'm going to be embarrassed. Um, <laughs> but, you know, um, it will, it will have a description of the problem here, uh, and you can kind of try it in here, and um, and then you can try running, uh, running the code and clicking submit, and it will uh, it will evaluate it, okay, and um, uh, and you can kind of look at, uh, after you solve it, you can also go to discussions, uh, and the discussions will talk about like certain uh, ways and approaches to the uh, the problem, right. So, um, you know, probably start off with the easy ones until you feel uh, fairly comfortable uh, with those. And then, um, and then you can move on to, um, to medium and things like that. So I think this is a, you know, real good place to, um, to, uh, to practice, okay? So. Okay. So, um, so as far as, um, so I, I, I don't think I'm, I'm checking the, uh, the, the thing, but I don't think hacker rank, um, is going to let me share your scores, um, on the, uh, on, you know, on how you did in the, uh, the practice exam. And I, and I apologize for that. Um, so can you get partial credit if our code only passes some test cases? Yes. Um, so, so that so that will happen. 
Um, if, uh, if, your, if your code passes some of the cases, but not all of them, you will get some partial credit. Um, uh, Hacker rank will, um, will, will do your scores uh, do that way. So you get, you get points for basically the, uh, the different test cases. Hang on, my dog has got stuck behind this box. Okay, so um, so it's a good place to practice, um, and I will probably select uh, you know five problems or so that will um, uh, five or six problems with the goal of having the uh, hacker rank estimated time to be somewhere around like an hour and fifteen hour uh, hour and fifteen hour and a half, and I will give you the full um, I'll, I'll give you lots of time to uh, to finish. Okay. Okay, uh, any other questions um, regarding this? So I'll, I'll post a document kind of sharing uh, more details and then once I have the actual question set, I can at least give you a little bit of kind of uh, domain space uh, regarding like, this is kind of the general uh, domain that this question will test, things like that. Uh, and again, it is uh, open book and, or open, I guess, internet in that you can check um, you can search Google for documentation and how to accomplish a, a certain task. You're just not allowed to straight up plagiarize code, okay? And you're not allowed to talk to each other. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Um, so, um, I guess we'll go into kind of optional content here um, as far as, so, um, so I'll, I'll post a homework assignment, again, optional homework assignment that will cover pandas and numpy, um, I guess mostly pandas. Um, and then, uh, and this stuff is, you know, getting into scikit-learn, uh, just the very basics of it. And so I just kind of wanted to cover, you know, a few, um, additional tasks that could be useful um, as far as uh, scikit-learn goes, okay? Um, and so, so I have this notebook uh, and I just, uh, I think I just pushed it to, um, uh, I think I just pushed, oh, actually I haven't, uh, I, I'll, I'm pushing it now to, um, to GitHub, okay? So, okay, so it, it just got pushed to GitHub and, uh, and so you should be able to, Take a look at it. Okay, um, and so what we're going to do is um, we'll first cover uh, feature uh, engineering, and feature engineering is the idea of um, kind of finding um, uh, uh, basically uh, the variables and, and stuff that you can use in Scikit-Learn, right? And so um, if you have a um, if you have a categorical variable, scikit-learn won't be able to handle it, okay? Because uh, scikit-learn, um, its inputs are always going to be uh, numeric. So it's always expecting uh, an input matrix X uh, and a, a, a numeric one, right? So it's, it's always expecting the input matrix to be X. And so there's a few ways to, um, to go about this, but um, um, so one will be... Um, to turn a categorical variable into numeric variable, um, you know, one option would be to turn each of these um, values to uh, a number, like red becomes, so if you have colors like red, blue, and yellow, you can say red becomes one, blue becomes two, and yellow becomes three, but this is gonna be undesirable. This is not gonna work well because when scikit-learn sees those numbers, one, two, three, it's gonna think these are quantities, that yellow is, more than blue and blue is more than red and yellow has three times as much of something, whatever it is, than red does, which is, um, uh, but they don't represent quantities. They're just uh, integer labels for categories. And so uh, one idea is that you're gonna create three columns, one for each category. You're gonna have a column for red, a column for blue and a column for yellow. And, um, and for red, you'll get a one in the red column and zero for blue and yellow. 
for blue, you'll get a one in the blue column and a zero for everything else. And yellow will be uh, one in the yellow and zero for the red and blue. Okay. And so this, um, there is uh, a few, uh, function called the one hot encoder and, uh, and it's inside uh, sklearn.preprocessing. And so here I'm taking, um, there's a CSV uh, on the Titanic data set. And, uh, and so this is a Titanic uh, train, okay? Uh, the training set, so it's been uh, arbitrarily split into training and test data. And so we're gonna take the um, test um, CSV, or training CSV, and this is kind of um, the, uh, what it looks like. And so, um, so some things are already kind of categorized as zeros and ones, like survived, either they did or they did not, okay? Whereas um, the passenger class, the passenger class is uh, a categorical variable, okay? And, um, and sex, uh, male or female here, is a categorical variable as well. And so, um, so what you can do is we can establish the, uh, the one hot encoder here and, um, and, um, and what it will do is it will, um, by default it goes alphabetical. So the first column, when we take this, first column will be uh, female and the second column will be male. Okay, so male will get zero for the female column and one for the male column. And then uh, Mrs. John Bradley Cummings gets uh, one for the female column and zero for the male column. And Miss Lena Heikinen gets uh, one here and a zero there and so on and so forth. And so we can see how, um, so this, this matches up, okay? And so um, the way uh, the one high encoder works is generally you, um, you do a fit and then a transform, or you can do it in one step and you can do uh, encoder uh, fit transform, right? So encoder fit transform, same thing. Uh, we get the same results here. Uh, you can ask what were the categories and indeed it tells you it was uh, the first column represents female and the second column represents male. Uh, and if you want, you can take the results of fit transform and throw it into a data frame. And here we're gonna say, um, make a data frame out of the, uh, the fit transform results uh, applied to the sex column in Titanic, and then put the column labels um, being um, the encoder categories here. And so that's what we get, okay. Um, similar thing, passenger class. P passengers can be in first class, second class, and third class. And so here we're gonna run the, uh, the one hot encoder, okay? And, um, and so this uh, third class passenger, Mr. Owen Harris Braun, uh, three, um, if we allow the categories to be auto, He'll get a zero. This one will represent first. This one will represent second, and this one will represent third because it's a three. And so it will go uh, zero zero one. First class passenger is one zero zero. This is a third class passenger zero zero one. Things things like that. And you can ask what were the categories. And indeed, it says one, two, and three. Okay. And so um, if you want, you can t do um, run the one hot encoder on multiple. Um, on multiple categorical variables at the same time. So if I wanted to do passenger class and sex, I can run the one hot encoder there, right? So one hot encoder um, will turn passenger class into uh, 001, this third, third class, and then the male will become 01. So it's basically taking the results of this n by three matrix and this n by two matrix, and it's just pasting them together. Okay, or concatenating them side by side. Okay, so we can see this is a third class male, first class female passenger. This would be a third class female passenger, first class female passenger, third class male passenger. Okay, so we can see uh, this, this represents the class one, two, three, and this re represents female and male. Okay, and so this, um, this does the important task of turning your um, categorical data 
into numeric data, which can then be fed into scikit-learn. So scikit-learn can only accept numeric inputs and it cannot handle categorical data uh, in raw form. So you have to find a way to encode the categorical data into numeric um, values. And, uh, and one hot encoder is one way to do it, okay? Now, um, uh, uh, okay, so anyway, I did that. Um, here, uh, if you ask for the, um, the categories, it gives you back uh, a list of arrays, okay? So it says categories, you got one, two, three, categories male, female. So um, here I'm gonna create a list comprehension, which is gonna go through the valley, uh, value for, uh, for each array and then for each value in the array. So, uh, so this will kind of put everything together and this is what we get. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, another option, okay, there is something called drop, drop first, right? So one problem with uh, leaving this as one, two, three, and female, male, is that we have um, uh, collinearity, right? Um, in that uh, if you know, if you know the results of, uh, like you can infer the value of the first column by just seeing the values of the second and third column, right? So if you see a zero and a one here, right? So we know that these are all mutually exclusive. And so only one of these things can have a one. So if I have a zero and a one here, I know this has to be a zero because I already have a one here. However, if I have a zero and zero in the second and third columns, I know this first column has to be a one, right? And, um, and so you can drop the first column. Similarly, if, um, if we know someone is male, okay? You know, at least in our data, if we know someone is male, that we know they cannot at the same time be female. These, these columns are mutually exclusive in our data. Um, and if, if we have a zero here, this has to be a one, okay? So um, <clears throat> you can create the, uh, the one-hot encoder, okay? and uh, auto categories, but you can also say drop the first column, okay? And so when you do that, um, the passenger class, one, two, three, only now contains um, for column two and column three, okay? And it drops via the first column. So when we see this, we know this has to be a first class passenger, and then this column represents male. So these are males, and then this would be female, female, and so on and so forth, okay? so that's that's, that's possible, right? So it can drop the uh, first column for the class because it can be inferred from the other two columns. And then we can drop the column female because we can figure it out based on whether the person is male or not. Okay, at least in our, at least in our data set where only um, two sexes were represented in the data set. Okay, um, for all of these things, I've been using sparse equals false, okay? And um, another option, <laughs> is uh, to do uh, sparse equals true, okay? And what this will produce, if you do sparse equals true, it produces a kind of a, a giant uh, list of all the values that are take on the value one and everywhere else is zero, okay? So it gives you kind of the coordinate zero, two, okay? In that uh, row uh, index zero and column index two, right? Because this is column index zero, one, two, column index two has the value one, and then uh, row index zero, column index four has the value one, okay? And so here basically each, um, each passenger in our case will have uh, a one, uh, and it gives kind of the, um, we'll have two values of one. Um, the, this one will be for the, uh, the class, and this one will be for male or female. And, um, and so th what this will do is it'll list the coordinates in the matrix that have a one. And, uh, and so that's, that's what sparse encoding does. And in some cases, um, the um, scikit-learn can, can handle uh, incoming sparse data. So that's, that's an option. I often, I often use sparse equals false, because uh, I think in my brain, this, this, is a little, this makes a little bit more sense so this is probably the, uh, the most common options that I would use for the one-hot encoder 
would be sparse equals false and drop equals first. Okay, otherwise you got completely linearly dependent um, variables, which which will cause problems. Is that right? Okay. Um, other other handy things you can do is uh, fill in um, missing values. Okay. Um, so this is from uh, from Scikit-Learn. So we saw uh, some of this stuff kind of like when we were doing, um, um, I think, uh, in index uh, uh, re-indexing, right? So when we first introduced pandas and we did some re-indexing, um, re-indexing can sometimes introduce NAs and we had, we can say, you know, fill in the NAs a certain way, okay? Um, Scikit-learn uh, also has a tool for filling in uh, missing values, okay? And, um, and this is called the imputer, right? And this is because uh, it falls under the uh, um, notion of imputing uh, missing data. And there, there's, um, so I'm just showing you the simple imputer. There are uh, other, um, uh, different different ways to go about okay um, so this is stuff that you probably have not yet learned in your stats uh, classes but there are um, you know things such as the uh, nearest neighbors imputer okay uh, and basically it's going to um, kind of impute missing values by looking at the nearest neighbors and things like that okay so so these are kind of uh, some different uh, ideas that uh, that you can go about for imputing missing values we're going to just stick with the uh, the simple ones, which will include things like filling in uh, based on the column mean, okay, or uh, filling it in with a constant value, okay. Um, so, so for all of these things, um, these these fit under the kind of the fit transform because these are things that we're applying to x. So you know we'll take x which has missing values, the nands, okay. And, uh, and we'll say um, uh, impute the NANDs by using um, the, uh, the, mis the mean, okay? So strategy mean takes the mean of the column. So in this case, three, three, four, and eight. If you add up uh, those numbers, three, three, four, and eight, uh, you get 18 divided by four is four and a half. And so it fills it in with the column mean, right? And then here we have zero, seven, five, and eight. So that's 20, 20 divided by four is five. And so that um, it fills in the missing value of the five. So it's going to just fill it in with a column mean. Okay. You can also give it a constant and give it some kind of value here in this case, negative 99 or something. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and over here, you can then use the, um, if you have the imputed value, right? Like if, if you had missing values, you can't use, you can't apply linear regression. You can't make a prediction because you don't have a, a value there. And so, you can make predictions with it or something, okay? Um, and yeah, you can look up multiple imputation um, if that's something you want to want to introduce, such as um, you know you can fill in like if someone's height is missing, okay? What multiple imputation allows you to do is you can say rather than um, so the simple imputer would just be to fill in the mean value for uh, the person's height, if someone's missing the person's height. But you could have like um, height and mean, right? Uh, sorry, height and weight. And you can say, well, you know what? I can create a linear regression model between height and weight. So I know that there's a, uh, a relationship between height and weight. And then so based on someone's weight, what value would I predict for their height? Uh, you take that and then you plug that in for the missing value. And then if you have a multiple linear regression model that includes height, weight, and all of these other things to kind of make a prediction, right? So maybe you want to include, uh, predict someone's, um, I don't know, blood pressure based on their height and weight, okay? Then, um, uh, and you only have the person's weight, okay? So this would be a little bit of backwards thinking, right? Is that, so you're filling in, you know, there, there's a lot of assumptions going on here. But um, so, you know, you can say based on someone's height and weight, we're going to predict their blood pressure, right? Um, and, but let's say you only have the person's weight. 
again, you can use multiple imputation to say, all right, here's a person, this person weighs 200 pounds, so we're gonna predict they are you know, six foot two. Uh, this person weighs 130 pounds, so we're gonna predict they are five foot one or something, right? I'm mean, just making up numbers. Um, and then based on that, now you can fill in the blanks for, um, you can, now you have two values that you can then use to predict their blood pressure, okay? And of course, anytime you're imputing missing values, you're making major assumptions about what those missing values are, right? Um, but, it, but it's possible to do stuff like that with, uh, with multivariate imputation um, and, and you can kind of look up how, how that goes. Um, other things, maybe you wanna make um, fit a uh, um, regression using um, some kind of polynomial feature, right? So if you have an input matrix X, what you can do, right? So here I've got the input matrix X and Y, and so here linear regression is not gonna be sufficient, okay? Because this data does not fit a straight line. So what we can do is you can expand X, right? Um, using, uh, to create like a third degree polynomial. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, uh, one, two, three, four, five, and we have X raised to the zero power, which is all ones, X raised to the first power, which is one, two, three, four, five, and then to the second power, which will be the squares, one, four, nine, 16, 25, and then to the third power, which is one, two cubed is eight, three cubed is 27, four cubed is 64, and five cubed is 125, right? So this fills out kind of the polynomial features. And now that you have kind of this bigger matrix, then you can fit a linear regression model and you'll get um, you know, a better fitting value, right? So this is a, shows the results of fitting <coughs> uh, our predictions between um, the actual values and the, um, the linear regression there, right? I'm going through this very quickly. Uh, again, I'm not testing you on this, but if, if um, so, you know, I guess, I guess my hope is that after you take this class, you know, you would, you feel like you've learned a little bit of Python and that if you wanted to, all right, and I'm not saying you have to, but I think it's a good idea. If you wanted to just like take a toy, uh, take some data set that you find on Kaggle or someplace online, and you wanted to just fiddle around and um, play around with it in, in Python, that, that at least you have a basic tool, toolkit to get started on that kind of analysis. Or, you know, in, in the future, if you complete Pete and DataFest, that you can, um, if you wanted to, you can try doing it in Python rather than R. Um, and so I'm just kind of putting this uh, out as kind of a reference. Um, and you can kind of just look to see this. And again, the, the best reference is going to be the documentation. Um, but this is just kind of pointing certain things out that you might use, right? There's something called a feature pipeline, okay? And this might be kind of, um, you can um, say, create a pipeline, which is kind of basically certain steps that you're gonna apply to the data that you have. And so, um, so here, um, we're gonna create a pipeline where first we fill in the missing values, then we're gonna create polynomial features, and then we're gonna do linear regression, right? So here's my input X and my uh, uh, output Y, and, um, and so the model consists of doing these steps in a row, okay? And that's, so it's called a pipeline, right? So run X through the simple imputer. <clears throat> Once you fit doing X in the simple imputer, then run the kind of the results through polynomial features, and once you do that, then run it through linear regression. So, so we do that here. Here's our x, and then we run it through y, and um, and it it does this, okay? Um, and so here now we get uh, we get these values, and it probably overfits our data, <laughs> but but it um, but here's uh, what y is, and here's it's able to kind of fit the data perfectly and get um, get no errors here, right? Um, and, uh, and so here's another example, okay? So here's a new data set, and we're gonna just run through the uh, new data set, uh, and we uh, run the data through the pipeline. 
And so this is kind of, it's just a quick and efficient way to take new data and run it through the same steps. So I don't have to separately do the simple imputer and then follow that up by the polynomial features and then follow that up by linear regression, right? I can just say, run this pipeline, okay? Which is um, take the X, so once I reshape it into a matrix, I can run it and do model fit, model predict, okay? And so, so for this thing, um, this is what we have. It's gonna fill in the mean, uh, missing values. It's gonna create polynomial features and it's gonna make, make predictions between um, X and Y. And so this is useful if you have like a, a good model and a good set of steps to take. Um, this is kind of a simple way to kind of link uh, several steps together. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know if I should start getting into um, <laughs> text features, but um, <clears throat> if you have text data, you know, the problem again of doing machine learning is that you have to find a way to convert the text data into numeric data, okay? And so um, um, one thing that you can do is the count vectorizer, okay? And the count vectorizer is gonna go through and find all of the, so this is, <laughs> this is s silly, um, but this will be my corpus of documents. I have three documents in my corpus. So, so generally when you do text analysis, your documents are gonna be uh, a few hundred words long and your corpus will have thousands of documents, okay? And, and you're doing some kind of analysis there, like a sentiment analysis or something. Um, but here is a very, very simple corpus where I have three documents and each document is like two or three words, okay? But this allows you to kind of visualize what the count vectorizer is doing, okay? So it, it identifies the unique word, um, unique words in their entire thing, right? And so we've got problem of evil, that's three, queen, evil's not unique, and horizon. So we have a total of six unique um, unique words, okay? Problem of evil, I'm sorry, five, uh, queen and horizon. So we have five unique words. And so if I do count vectorizer, um, what it does, uh, we get the feature names and it will say, um, so it's alphabetized these, okay? So the first word is evil. First column represents evil, okay? And so problem of evil gets a one for evil, okay? A one for the word of, and a one for the word problem, okay? Evil queen gets a one for the word evil, and then the last word represents queen, so it gets there. And then here we have horizon problem, and we get a one for the word horizon, and one for the word problem, okay? So, so this is, uh, takes your documents and it converts it into what we call uh, a bag of words, okay? So it does not preserve the structure, right? So evil of problem of evil problem of problem evil would all have the same count vectorizer result, right? Because they're all, they all have the same words. And so whatever arrangement that you put them in, you can get the same, um, same kind of counts there. All it's doing is counting the words, okay? And so this is, this is what we have there. And then you have something called the TF-IDF, right? So this is text frequency inverse document frequency matrix, okay? And, uh, and what this does is it comes up with a number, okay? And you can uh, read up on it on, on Wikipedia here. But it gives a number for how strongly a word is associated with a particular document, okay? And so, um, so there's certain um, words, right? Certain words will only apply to certain contexts and situations. So if you hear somebody talk about, oh, you know, let's look at the stats on this, okay? Or you just over, you're at a, you know, restaurant. I, don't know, I guess nobody goes to restaurants anymore, but like, okay, let's say you're in some place and you overhear a conversation and you hear someone say the word stats, you're, you're, ears might perk up because you go, oh, I wonder if they're interested in statistics, but then it turns out they're just talking about sports or something, and you know, that could be interesting still, but, um, but not necessarily um, something, right? But then you hear, uh, let's say the word, um, so you overhear someone say the word um, Bayesian, okay? When, when you hear that, you go, oh man, that person's gotta be a statistician because it's hard to think of very many other contexts 
where someone's going to be using the word Bayesian um, and something. So, so the word Bayesian uh, gets used a lot in statistics, but very few other contexts. So it's going to have a high value as far as kind of the TFIDF, right? And so, so in this case, if we look at the word, say, uh, queen, okay, it only shows up in one document, and so it gets a very high TFIDF rating for that one document, okay? Whereas, uh, say, the word um, problem, okay, or evil, okay, so one document was evil queen, okay, and then the other one was problem of evil, okay? And so here, the word evil has a lower association with the document than queen because the word evil showed up in two documents, whereas the word queen showed up in only that one document, okay? And then over here, evil has a lower rating even in, further in this one because this one had three words in it, okay? And as far as the word uh, evil goes, um, it shows up in two documents and it's just one of the three, three words in this thing, okay? So, um, so anyway, there, uh, there's math behind this, but it kind of gives us uh, a sense of how strongly a certain word could be uh, associated with the document there. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll end here for today. Uh, this will be it for like lecture content. Um, on Friday, uh, we'll just take it easy. Um, um, you know, all of these lectures are optional. So, um, so we'll end here for today. And um, yeah, we'll see you guys. Uh, maybe on Friday, let me know if you want to um, postpone the exam or anything like that. I want to be uh, accommodating and, um, and flexible uh, regarding that, regarding your, um, your own needs and, and stuff. Okay, um, that's it. Uh, have a good day, and, uh, and we'll, see you, we'll see you later.